Welcome to the Be Well Buzz podcast, your number one weekly source for natural health and wellness. This is your resident nutritionist, Sean Stevenson. When you make the quantum leap to being conscientious about your food choices, it's truly one of the most life-changing experiences that you can ever have. It changes the entire landscape of how you relate to your own body, to your family, your community, and your environment. Most vegans and vegetarians take on their honorable lifestyle and respect to their health and to the planet. The only limitation in this is that by the very nature of being a human being, we intrinsically act upon the information that we have available at the time. In passionate efforts to detach from animal products, most vegans and vegetarians shift over to a food product that's been discovered to promote an equally troubling health epidemic. In thousands upon thousands of documented studies, processed soy products have been found to be horrifically damaging to the body. Today I'm going to take you through and look at the actual science behind it and how things have actually gotten to be this way. And I'm going to share with you what foods to incorporate to fill the void that's left by artificial soy foods. So we're going to start off with one of the dominant compounds found in soy that are known as isoflavones. Now isoflavones in and of themselves are not a dangerous thing. In fact, some of these are very, very valuable. It's just the sheer concentration of isoflavones that are found in soy that can be so troubling. And here's why. These are known as phytoestrogens or plant estrogens. And it's been shown now that they actually mimic the effects of female hormones in both men and women. And what they do essentially is attach the receptor sites in our body for the estrogen hormone. And this creates situations in the body that are known as estrogen dominance, which can cause a whole manner of diseases ranging from breast cancer, heart disease, stroke. In men in particular, this is linked up to depression of secondary sex characteristics and infertility. Now, being from a plant source, you would think that these estrogen compounds would be relatively safe. But that's just not the case. Estrogen levels in things like soy beverages have been found to be 20,000 times higher than birth control pills. And again, this wouldn't be such a huge issue if it weren't for the huge array of soy products that people are consuming on a day-to-day -day basis, unknowingly just guzzling this stuff down. We've got tofu, soy milk, soy infant formula, soy cheese, soy breakfast sausage, soy lunch meat, soy burgers, soy eggs, soy hot dogs, soy oils, soy yogurt, soy snack bars, and on and on and on. And this is contributing to a huge problem with our health. Have you noticed that kids are now starting puberty much, much earlier? With some kids starting menstruation as early as seven, that's kindergarten. And that is totally, you know, the kid is trying to work on their coloring and making trees and they're dealing with being on their period. This is very abnormal. And this is something that a lot of people are putting their attention on or they just kind of brush under the table. But this is becoming a very, very common occurrence in our children. You know, it might not just be seven years old, it may be 10 years old, but this is abnormal. And according to the research, the soy isoflavones, again, they mimic estrogen and they're able to bind to the estrogen receptor sites in your little girl's body and turn on the physical and emotional characteristics of puberty. Now, there's definitely other factors that are contributing to the situation that we're dealing with today with our children. You know, the plasticizers, the BPA, bisphenol A, these are xenoestrogens. These also mimic the effects of estrogens in our body, attaching to receptor sites and causing all kinds of issues. Pesticides is another one. You know, pesticides are generally neurogenic or estrogenic, which is intended to screw up the reproductive cycle of the pests, but it gets concentrated in all these different foods that we're eating that are not organic, you know, pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, rodenticides, all these things that are sprayed onto our foods, and we're consuming them in mass and don't even know it. And this is a, the same case as well for grain products, for dairy products, for animal foods as well. They're all interacting and exposing us to more pesticides. So this is basically contributing to this overall bank account that we're building up with this estrogen dominance. So it's not just soy, but these are some of the big, big factors that we can take control of and remove from our nutrition strategy. And some people may say, well, I'm not eating soy and I'm not feeding it to my children, 
But that's not all the way true in many cases because somebody could be eating factory farm animals who are being fed soy and getting it secondhand via that animal because that is not that animal's natural food either. So take, for example, the cow that may be fed soy. Cows have evolved eating grass and eating hay to feed these animals soy. And essentially what's been found is that this can really, quote, fatten the animal up because it depresses many metabolic factors in not just cows, but in humans as well. So people that are not eating grass-fed meat and that are eating uh, dairy that is not grass-fed, they're going to be getting these compounds in their body via that way as well. So that's just shining a light on it when somebody thinks that I'm not being exposed to these things. Well, think again. Now, let me get back to the issue at hand here because I'm very, very concerned about our children and I'm very, very passionate about this. And again, you don't have to just listen to the expert. Do your research yourself and find out if this is an appropriate thing for you and your family and share this information because it's very, very important and very valuable. It's been estimated that infants fed soy formula have 13 to 22,000 times the amount of estrogen in their little bodies than infants that are fed breast milk, which is their natural food, or other types of formula. That in and of itself should give us a real big gut check to understanding that there's definitely something going on here and it's contributing in a large way to the health and the wellness of our children and as well as as they evolve to being adults. And on that note, women who were fed soy formula as a child have a 25% greater incidence of having fibroid tumors. And that's just another little fun fact to know about soy, you know, and really understanding that this is affecting the child's entire life and their experience of health as they go on later in life. This isn't just a childhood issue. This is something that has long-term effects if we don't remedy the situation. And so the statistics show that infants that are fed soy formula are taking in three to five times the amount of estrogen found in birth control pills every single day. And this is just simply not appropriate. And for the new mother who you might be sharing this with or who might be listening to this now, it's not to be upset and up in arms that you've done something wrong or done something that is harming your child. Your child right now is healthy, happy, and whole. And this is just a great wake-up call or an adjustment to put this stuff to the side and incorporate more things that are real and natural because soy, you know, the bottom line is that being utilized as formula, this is a new thing. This is a new invention that's only happened the past couple of decades. When we have thousands upon thousands of years of evolution not feeding this stuff to our children, you know, so it's not being upset. You know, we do what we know how to do at the time. And of course, we've all done things listening to particular health experts and our doctors and physicians about health and doing certain things that we find out later on were not the right thing for us. And it's okay. It's just being strong enough and having the courage and the heart to make the adjustment now. That's what's most important. So I hope everybody's got it as far as the effect that it's having on children. So let's just look at the adults now. Let's just jump up here and, you know, we're not drinking infant formula, but we are drinking soy milk and people are drinking a lot of it. You know, it's actually... The, the industry has shifted over a lot because of some of the other products out there, the, the almond milk and the rice milk and all these different things, but soy milk is still a big part of a lot of people's lives. Just two cups of soy milk daily for one month has been found to have enough estrogen side effects to negatively alter menstrual cycles. And this is because of the vast amount of estrogen receptors that are found in the reproductive organs. So having that much estrogen exposure is going to inherently contribute to things like fibroid tumors as well as breast cancer and other reproductive issues. So now let's take a step away from the estrogen factors that are found in soy, because it's just one issue. It's the big issue, but it's just one of the issues found here. Because soy also has some other really gnarly things that are found in it that a lot of people are not aware of. One of those things are the goitrogens. And goitrogens are some other compounds that are normally found in an abundance of foods, but it's the concentration in soy as well as the amount that we're consuming that are causing the big problem. Goitrogens are known to damage the thyroid function. And soy milk, for example, allows you to drink a huge amount. Other foods that have goitrogens are broccoli, for example. But people are not guzzling down broccoli milk or making broccoli burgers or broccoli sausage. You know, people are not doing that, but they're doing this with soy. And of course, we found that we can do certain things to the broccoli to 
uh, eliminate a lot of those compounds because broccoli has a lot of other healthy compounds and components that are very, very important to the body, especially its anti-cancer properties. While soy, on the other hand, the research about soy being so beneficial, it's just not there. You know, if you take a look at the studies, you know, go to PubMed and look at some of the studies, a lot of the studies are not turning out in favor of soy being beneficial in hardly any way at all. You know, it's just marketing. It's something that we've been sold and we wanted to do better and we shifted over to get off all of the animal proteins and we just use this as a filler and basically doing the same thing. Instead of eating a burger, we're eating a soy burger. Instead of drinking milk, we're drinking soy milk. Trying to do the same things and what you're going to find at the end of the day is that it's not leading you to the health and, and longevity that we know are actually possible for us. So that's one of the big issues here is with the thyroid. And we know the thyroid is all about our metabolism. It's the master regulator of our metabolism. So if individuals are having trouble gaining or losing weight, hyper or hypothyroid, these goitrogens found in soy are likely having an impact if somebody's consuming it. And on that same note, and I'll just add this in here, there was one study that showed soy formulas contained approximately six times more cadmium than cow's milk formulas. And cadmium is a heavy metal that, I mean, there's been a tremendous amount of recalls from children's toys to food all over the world because of the contamination of cadmium. And it appears to be the largest single contributor to autoimmune thyroid disease, according to several health experts. So there again, it's hitting the thyroid in a negative way because the soy has this affinity with, with uptaking these heavy metals and then delivering them into your body. That's just not good. That's not a sexy thing to happen. So again, it's just another check against soy no more. I'm soy over you. Now let's take a look at the allergies and autoimmune conditions associated with soy. There was a study published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition with 1,601 young adults. And this study showed that soy beverages increased asthma symptoms and overall asthma risk. Now, right there, many parents who become aware of the dangers of pasteurized homogenized dairy products will shift over and start feeding their child or themselves soy milk. Now we find out why their symptoms are not subsiding. And actually, in this particular study, it showed that the people who were consuming the milk didn't react hardly at all as compared to the people in the soy group. And all this can be boiled down to the, the linked associated gut damage that's coming from consuming soy. So soy has certain what are called anti-nutrients in them that actually can damage the lining of the gut. And when that happens, of course, we know now, especially from understanding what I shared in the Invincible Gut Health podcast, that gut damage is a direct link to the underlying autoimmunity. So when the lumen, intestinal lumen in your gut gets damaged and whole proteins can get into your circulation of your blood, this is going to set off an immune cascade. And soy is one of those foods that has a tremendous amount of allergies associated with them, but people just don't know. So that's that. We're going to move on and take a look at, while we're on the topic of the anti-nutrients, let's talk about phytates. There are phytates that are contained in soy, and these inhibit assimilation of minerals in particular. So phytates block the absorption of important minerals, in particular zinc. And by the way, zinc is critical for your immune function. Iron, blood builder, iodine, again, there's a thyroid function. Phytates that are found in soy blocks the absorption of iodine. So again, that depresses your thyroid. Calcium and magnesium. So it blocks the absorption of all these different minerals and other things. And these are all minerals that are essential for cardiovascular health, brain development, your immune function, muscle and bone development, and more. So... Make note of that, and I hope that you're taking notes so that you get the big guns and have these things written down and understood so that when you share this information with people, you're coming from a place of science, not just saying, oh, that's bad for you, but actually understand what are the different compounds and elements found in soy that are so damaging. We can't just say, oh, it's bad for you. We need to understand why, because not many people realize this, but the soy industry has grown tremendously from 1992 to 2007. Sales increased from a dismal $300 million to nearly $4 billion. Billion. $4 billion in just about 15 years. So this is not a small thing. And a lot of people are actually addicted to soy. And I'm going to tell you about that in just a moment. 
But first, let's look at some of the other anti-nutrients that are found in soy. Soy also contains enzyme inhibitors, in particular is a trypsin inhibitor. And what these do is actually block the absorption of proteins. Now we know how important proteins are. These are the building blocks. We need those amino acids to actually do all kinds of functions and to rebuild us, to rebuild our structure, to contribute to our musculature, our vision, our brain function. We need these very, very critical proteins. And that was the big marketing thing is that, okay, stop eating animal foods. Protein is here to save the day. It's got tons of protein, but is it absorbable? Is it actually blocking the absorption of protein and other proteins? That's the real question. And according to the science, yes, that's so. This is why individuals, you know, even though we've shifted over and start eating more plant-based proteins, people's health is still declining. Because utilizing soy protein as a protein source, you may actually end up having a protein deficiency. And this is also true because it depletes enzymes in the body. And enzymes, they're essentially protein in nature, but these are biological and chemical catalysts. So these essentially enable your body to do everything that it does. So they're pretty important. And this depletes those processes because this is not a real food. It's a fake food, and it's going to require your body's own metabolic and digestive enzymes to be elicited. And it's going to start to basically drain your life energy. And that sounds a little bit airy-fairy, but on a technical term, we'll say it's bioelectricity. So your bioelectricity gets depleted by ingesting these dead foods in the form of all these glorious soy products. And this is because there's no real life force in this food. Now, being a substandard source of protein, some individual is going to say, well, hey, it worked for this person. It was their protein source and they were a bodybuilder or whatever the case may be. This is where it comes to the place of our genetic strengths and weaknesses to begin with, you know, because it does play a part. Epigenetics is the most influential factor for sure. So the environmental things, the foods that we're consuming, however, it depends on the person. You know, if they already have a strong genetic disposition and strong digestion, naturally good levels of hormones, they can incorporate this stuff for quite a long time. And it's not going to show up that they have any particular deficiencies or big time problems now. But this is a new food again. So we haven't seen what happens to the people long term. And I just don't want you to be around to wait and see what happens. We just want to pull this stuff out now because we've seen enough evidence that this is not the health food that has been marketed as. As a matter of fact, it's one of the most damaging foods that human beings can be consuming. And yet another reason why this is, is that 90 to 95% of all soy grown domestically is genetically modified. That's almost all of it. So all these different products that people are consuming are genetically modified soy. And the studies behind what's going on here are shocking. While digging through the research, what I found is that with animal studies, and I'm not a fan at all of animal studies, but this is just what was available, is that second and third generation of animals consuming GM genetically modified soy were found to be infertile and sterile. So it wasn't happening necessarily in that first generation. It was their offspring that were unable to reproduce, essentially. And this is not good. So it might not bear that much weight on yourself. It might bear weight on your grandchildren by consuming genetically modified soy. And again, that's the vast majority of soy. It's almost impossible to avoid it actually because of that cross-contamination with soy and all the associated issues coming along with that and by the way it wasn't just the second and third generations were infertile and sterile they also had a higher infant mortality rate so please understand that genetically modified soy is a big issue and when we're genetically manipulating any food source it's automatically it's intrinsically going to have uh, disharmony or it's not going to have a resonance with the human body because we've not evolved with that particular species of food. Not only have we not evolved eating soy, period, in the fashion that we do, but genetically modifying that soy makes it completely disharmonic with the human body. And I hope that makes sense. So let's look at a few other things that are going on with the soy that you need to know about. And let's move on to soy protein isolate. Now you might see that on a lot of these snack bars, different protein products. The first thing to understand is that MSG, monosodium glutamate, is routinely added to soy protein isolate. This is like an automatic thing. It's one of those things that 
uh, is, is legal actually to mask MSG under. And just a quick synopsis on MSG, it's what's known as an excitotoxin. It basically stimulates your brain cells to the point that they actually die. And this is linked up very strongly to obesity, cancer, diabetes, and actually MSG is known to be nicotine for food. It's been pulled out of many products on store shelves because of the public's greater awareness, but these same companies have been putting this stuff in their food to make you addicted or to make you um, chemically love or get get ravenous about a particular food. You know, you shouldn't, I know I shouldn't eat that fill in the blank, whatever it might be for you, but you keep finding yourself doing it. MSG is one of those compounds that it contributes to that type of behavior. It's very, very addictive and soy protein isolate is one of those things that is di directly connected and routinely added along with MSG to different foods. Now that's one side of the soy protein isolate. On the other side, we found that soy protein isolate produces almost twice the amount of insulin-like growth factor. So that's IGF-1 than cow's milk concentrates. And what we now know is that IGF-1 is likely the strongest cancer stimulator that humans consume. It's a good thing when it's in balance, but it's a bad thing when we have an overconsumption of this stuff. And our society, our community is definitely consuming an overwhelming amount of IGF-1. And as we've seen the results, cancer is just running rampant. And again, soy is not the culprit here. It's that overall stress load that's getting put onto our bodies, these overall concentration of carcinogens that we're exposed to every day. So with protein isolate containing such a concentrated amount of IGF-1, it is definitely a carcinogen. And we need to be aware of that and to protect ourselves accordingly. Now next up, you know, I listed a whole bunch of different soy foods that are available and I did it too. I had the little soy deli slices and making sandwiches and soy milk and all those things. This is coming from a place of experience and an intimate connection with these things. However, you know, I woke up to that and eliminated that stuff and my health has just steadily improved as a result. Now, one of the big ones, this is one of the really, really big ones is, and what you find is that soy is being used to make all kinds of stuff. And that's why that, you know, it's gone to a $4 billion industry. One of these big ones is soy oil, soy oil, AKA vegetable oils. You know, vegetable, what vegetables have oils? You know, think about that for a second. Can you get broccoli oil or cauliflower oil or tomato oil? Uh-uh, it's not that. These are, these are between, this is corn oil, soy oil, canola oil, that vegetable oil that's marketing. You know, it's just, and it sounds healthy. You know, I'm cooking in vegetable oil. Not so. You're cooking in soy oil, which is a really, really high concentrate of omega-6 fatty acids. And omega-6 in and of themselves, when they're in balance, is a wonderful thing. But these are the pro-inflammatory omega fats. These are the pro-inflammatory, where omega-3s are known to be the anti-inflammatory essential fatty acids. So when these are in balance, all is well. Now, our diet should be about one to two or one to one omega-3 to omega-6. Commonly today, we're at about a one to 20 to one to 22 ratio of omega-3 to omega-6. So we're chronically inflamed. And inflammation, what we now know is that it's the underlying catalyst for almost every disease, there's a huge inflammation component there. And what's one of the big ways we're getting this in? Vegetable oils, soy oil, that's in a tremendous amount of packaged foods. And if you're cooking with it, throw it away right now. Don't even give it away. It is one of the worst things you can possibly consume. It's a polyunsaturated oil. So that means cooking with it at even moderate temperatures can damage the structure of the oil. It oxidizes very quickly. And these oxidized oils are very damaging to the body. These are um, basically flip and become what are known as trans fats. So trans fatty acids are directly linked to cardiovascular disease, specifically cancer, neurological issues. And it starts off as this little bottle of oil, but you'll find that polyunsaturated oils are very, very unstable. And what we want to do from here on out is shift over completely and use stable saturated fats for cooking purposes. In particular, coconut oil is wonderful there. 
Another very powerful saturated fat that's been used for countless centuries is real butter, unpasteurized raw butter. If somebody's not taking a vegan approach, then that would be one of the things to look to. You know, we were marketed to, and I remember this when I was a kid, that my grandparents started to use um, this country crop. You know, and I'd always see that. And you know, so seeing my grandfather spreading that on his food. And I remember um, him being exposed to a tremendous amount of suffering and having multiple open heart surgeries. And I just wish that I had the opportunity to share this information with him and to help him. But I was just a kid. And, you know, what was going on was the marketing and demonization of a food that's been consumed for thousands of years, which is coconut. So the coconut industry really got labeled as being so bad for you. But we know now, especially in this community, that it's just not the case. Coconut oil is antiviral, antifungal, antimicrobial, antiparasitic. The medium chain triglycerides are incredibly powerful and uh, great for your thyroid function. It's great for your cardiovascular health. It's great for blood sugar regulation. It's great for your skin. In many metabolic types, it can be transferred over to instant energy. So your body just gets a nice little burst of energy if if it's one of those foods that really resonates with you you know and the most valuable part about it is that it's stable you know that saturation makes it very very stable when it's exposed to light heat air everything that stuff does not go bad under almost any condition versus if you leave the cap off of your soy oil for even an hour it's going to oxidize and if you consume that it's going to cause some problems so that's one of the big takeaways from today is shift over exclusively for your cooking to using coconut oil and or butter and or ghee, which is another product derived from butter. Now with that said, in our kind of conscientious shifting from consuming these products to being focused on what's real and natural, we need to understand something that there's an industry that's been the undercurrent of our society for many decades that's really causing a lot of health problems in our culture. And this is the fast food industry. Nearly 100% of fast foods and over 60% of all processed foods contain soy. So those are some statistics to tell you right there. If you should be pulling up at that drive through window and talking to somebody who really doesn't even care about you, ordering food that's very, very cost intensive but doesn't cost much and being lured into that whole situation and understanding that all that stuff has soy in it. And this is why, quote, fast food is a catalyst for a lot of the damage that's been done to our population. So cut the cord completely, set the standard, and do not settle, no matter what the conditions are, for investing in fast food. What they're doing right now, and I'm not into the conspiracy theories, you can just look and see it. This is some last ditch efforts that are going on. You can see the signs when you're driving down the highway. They've got the, the new value menus where you get, you know, the same old nasty burger, but you get a salad instead of french fries, you know, or you come there and you get your fresh made, and I said fresh made, that's a complete joke, you get your fancy yogurt instead of getting your apple pie, you know, you get the yogurt with the berries and all that stuff that are, of course, they have pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, rodenticides, and, you know, a delicious yogurt that has all that stuff in it, but they're just, they're doing their last hope efforts to keep people coming in because more and more people are waking up to this and saying no I will not invest in any way and no don't go there and buy a salad you know some people do that you're investing in the problem you vote with your dollar and it's time to say no it's time to vote with your dollar and invest in companies that care about you invest in the local farmers who are providing the real food for you and your family it's time and all this information is about that very thing it's being empowered and understanding that knowledge is not power. Knowledge applied is power. And not just taking this information and sitting on it and filing it away in your mind, but utilizing it. So if there's any reservation still in your mind about soy, and you know, one of the typical arguments is that Asian cultures have really thrived on a soy-based diet. But the real fact is that these cultures have traditionally eaten very, very small amounts of soy products most of which are fermented. And when you ferment a substance, it's a completely different substance altogether. And mostly these would be used as a condiment. These are a side. So this is a far cry from the soy cheese, the soy milk, the soy protein bars, the soy burgers, the soy breakfast, sausage, bacon, 
omelet, soy, ice cream. It's a far cry from all that stuff. You know, people use that as an excuse to indulge in those things that they become attracted to. And what could contribute some value to you would be the fermented versions, you know, the miso, the, the natto, the tempeh, in some small amounts adding to your nutritional strategy. Uh, they're going to be providing some nutrition that you can't find in other foods in very high concentrations. You know, like the natto, you got vitamin K2 there. And again, this is a fermented food. This is not something that we're consuming on a regular basis today. And also something valuable to mention would be like the soy sauce, like the soy kind of salty uh, fermented dip or condiment, you know. So this is where we're looking at it as, as a condiment, not in any way as an entree should soy be treated ever again. Now, all of this that we've covered today, this often comes as a shock to the vegetarian community, including this is what happened with myself. As soy was a, it, it made things as an easy transition from a life that was dependent on meat. And with soy becoming the new default focus, it happened by default, we can enjoy the same style of foods, you know, the burgers, the cheese, the sausages, the milk, all that kind of stuff. But the truth of the matter is that most people unknowingly shift to being a pure junk food vegetarian and really have not elevated themselves to the place of health and the place of consciousness that we truly want to be at. So I want to share with you now what are some things that we can actually incorporate to fill that void that's left by soy. So the bottom line is we want to eat way, way less industrial processed foods. Let this brief interaction with soy that our culture has had be a lesson to us that we're putting to the side once and for all. Make a commitment today to drop the soy, say I'm soy over it, and just put it to the side completely. And understand, use this as a big underlying lesson to eat less processed packaged foods from these industrial conglomerates that are just not caring about you and putting out a bunch of garbage. We want to eat more foods that have life force in it, foods that actually have enzymes intact, vital nutrients, phytochemicals, vitamins, minerals. You're going to find this in fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, seaweeds, sprouts, all kinds of different things. There, I mean, literally tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of different foods out there that we don't get exposed to. We're trying to eat the same thing over and over again in a different version. So instead of a, a hamburger made from a cow, we're eating a hamburger made from a soy plant. Instead of cheese, we're eating soy cheese. Instead of milk, we're drinking soy milk. We're trying to do the same stuff, and we're just utilizing only one food, the soybean, when there are so many different foods that we have access to now, and it's time for us to shift our attention over there. So for non-vegans, let me give you some strategies. For non-vegans, instead of obviously the whole soy thing, which is not a big problem for non-vegans usually, Grass-fed beef, grass-fed meat, dairy that are all grass-fed. And this is important as a secondhand thing, making sure that you're not eating animal foods that have been raised eating soy. And how do you do this? You make sure that it's grass-fed, grass-fed dairy in particular. So if you're eating dairy, making sure that it's raw dairy. And you probably, depending on where you live in the country or uh, abroad, internationally, you might have to hook up with a farmer to get dairy. You know, there are different laws in different states, different laws in different countries. And the same thing with eggs. It's a very funny thing. If you look at some of the different egg cartons, you can see that the eggs are fed some superfood, which is soy. And it's just not normal. That's not normal chicken food. So we don't want to get the stuff secondhand via the chicken being a sick bird. Okay, so that's the strategy for non-vegans. For vegans, and this is where the real impact is going to take place, because we want to be the healthiest vegan possible we want to show what's possible. We want to be the healthiest vegetarian possible and make more people attracted to this lifestyle rather than trying to force feed people and telling them how much better it is without having the real science and being the physical example yourself. So for vegans, rather than the soy, these are some things that can make some incredible different uh, burgers and all kinds of different patties and all kinds of stuff like that. Mushrooms. You're going to have to get in the kitchen and start making your own food. So utilizing mushrooms can make all kinds of wonderful different meals and burgers and pâtés and things like that. And then from there, utilizing nut and seed pâtés. There's so many different recipes out there. You can make some great tasting cheeses utilizing nuts and seeds, and it's just fantastic. It actually tastes way, way better than the fake soy cheese slices that you see in the grocery store. So making your own nut and cheese pâtés, and it doesn't take much time once you learn how to do it. 
And then from there, we can combine the mushrooms and or the nuts and seeds together with vegetables and make different burgers and, and sausage patties, meatloafs and all kinds of things like that. So as far as getting that filler, you know, getting something really meaty in, nature's provided us with mushrooms and they've got a tremendous amount of health benefits, including vitamin D, including minerals, antioxidants, enzymes. These are real live food. We want to shift over and incorporate more living foods that have life force to them in place of the dead soy foods that we were eating before. Okay, so now let's look at protein. So instead of the soy protein stuff that we were consuming before, what we want to look at now is adding in superfoods. So real protein sources, raw live protein sources like spirulina, 71% protein by weight, chlorella, blue green algae, hemp seeds, you know, the real hemp seeds themselves are about 35% protein by weight. So just a couple of tablespoons of hemp seeds sprinkled onto your salad or making it to your superfood shake or whatever the case may be is 11 grams of protein. So if you need more protein, have four tablespoons. You know, this is something pretty easy to add in and it's going to be a nice filler there as far as the protein if you're concerned about that. There's so many other wonderful products coming out now. They're actually hemp proteins, bio-fermented rice proteins. So making sure, if at all possible, that these are non-GMO when looking into things like that. Traditionally used for quite a while now are different pea proteins and things like that. But you've got to make sure that you're getting these from reputable sources, reputable companies that actually care about the products where they're coming from and they care about you. Now, how we started off the podcast was the discussion about formula. So where do we go from here if we are not giving our kids this damaging soy infant formula anymore? We're exposing it today. Now tens of thousands of people more are going to know about this. And what we want to understand first and foremost is that breastfeeding is best by far. It's not even comparable. That is a natural food for the baby. There's nothing, you know, mothers were marketed to that their breast milk was insufficient, that the baby wasn't going to get enough if they weren't on this formula. And that's how the women were seduced. And now I'm asking and I'm calling on you to take your power back and understand that your baby's getting everything that they could possibly need via your breast milk. So that is the number one choice and the number one decision there, and making sure that your nutrition is shored up so that your baby's getting everything that they could possibly need. Now, in the instance, in the rare instance that an individual is not producing enough milk or there's some kind of complication there, we want to look to, and this is going to bump up against some people's belief systems, but we want to go with what's natural and real and is alive. The key word is alive. So not even going towards something down the line of doing some kind of a formula or some isolated protein compounds. We want something that's alive, that has the enzymatic properties, that has the, the structure of proteins in a natural state that have not been denatured. So this is where we're going to look to something like raw goat's milk. That's going to be the second tier. You know, When we get into issues of ethics, we want to look at what's going to be best for that human's thriving first and foremost. So when I say goat's milk, because... According to the research, it has a greater resonance with the human body than bovine or cow milk. But that is another option that's very close to that would be to get raw cow's milk. And that's where I'm going to leave it for today. So breast milk is by far the best. And just to avoid the whole complication in the first place, I want you to make sure that you do your research beforehand, before getting pregnant, before having a child, to ensure that you're providing an abundant source of milk throughout your entire pregnancy. And this is really going to be dependent on your modulation of stress, your nutrition, your exercise. All these things are going to contribute to having a really healthy pregnancy as well as a healthy baby. Now, as for milk and soy beverages, this is the best news ever right here. This is what changed me because I was a big time milk guy. Even though I had asthma and allergies and all this stuff, I kept drinking that milk even though it was organic. I pulled that out and I was going through some withdrawals for probably about a week and then my mother-in-law made some almond milk you know she actually studied down at Ann Wigmore's Institute in Puerto Rico and brought back a lot of these technologies that I thought she was crazy but when I had that almond milk it was like the nectar of the heavens it was so good so make your own almond milk make your own hemp milk these are incredible substitutions again it just takes a little bit more time to learn the strategies you know and in my book the key to quantum health I say very specifically how to make these different almond milks, 
how to make different nut and seed pâtés, you know, taco salad and all these kind of things. And you don't need anything but a blender and or a food processor to do a lot of this stuff. It's just we don't know what we don't know. So when you know better, you do better. When you get the information in your hands, you can make some powerful shifts in your health and you're getting a lot more live foods into your body. And that should be our goal here. Lastly, I want to share with you some things that you can do if you feel that you've been wrongly harmed by the consumption of soy. So what we want to do is get the estrogen dominance out of our system. Some simple things to look into and research, and we could do a whole podcast on all these things, but I'm just going to give you the information and you go do your research and see if it seems like it's going to be a good fit for you. You can incorporate things like diendol methane, or also known as DIM, aromatase inhibitors, including more cruciferous veggies in your diet, in particular broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, fermented veggies also is a great way to go. These things help to remove bad estrogen from the system. Also cruciferous superfood like maca, that can also be valuable. And it's also noted to basically function and focus on the hypothalamus in your brain, essentially sorting out your entire endocrine system. So maca can be a really great adjunct to something to add in here. Also, if we're looking at eliminating bad estrogen, we want to be able to identify the organs that are responsible for detoxifying our body and processing this stuff. So we want to focus on detoxifying and improving our liver function. So adding things in like milk thistle, for example, or something as simple as lemon water. Lemons have an anionic spin, which is very, very powerful at cleansing and detoxifying essentially your entire body, but it has a great resonance for cleansing and detoxifying your liver. We also want to clean up our skin and our other detoxification channels because that's how the stuff is going to get out of us. So making sure that we're exercising, moving our body, make sure that our colon is clean and we're including a nice amount of high quality plant fiber in our diet. Make sure that our lungs are working properly, breathing deeply, doing some breathing exercises. Exercising is great for your lung capacity as well, obviously. And from there, your lymphatic system, which is your cellular sewage treatment system. And how do we move our lymph? By moving by exercising. All these things are going to create and contribute to a healthy and happy whole individual. So that's the news on soy. Share this with all the people you care about. I've packed a lot of information into this. Now you've got it forever to keep. So you can go back and listen to this anytime that you want to if you ever need a friendly reminder. So again, share the information. Share the good health and wellness. This is Sean Stevenson signing off from Be Well Buzz, and I'll talk with you soon. Thank you for listening. Go to www.bewellbuzz.com for more natural health information and subscribe to our free weekly newsletter. Don't forget to share this podcast with your family and friends. Stay tuned for more from Be Well Buzz.